Great. Thanks very much, everyone. Uh, so obviously, as the title implies, I'm here to talk about threat modeling and how it can help SOX. So to give you a bit of a background, I've worked in and around SOX for pretty much my whole career. So either as a security analyst in a SOC, building new SOX, or in my current role where kind of I help customers develop SOX or kind of improve their current solution. Um, so again, I've seen a lot of SOX, a lot of different types of SOX, a lot of different names, CDC, ASOC, GSOC, kind of every, every acronym you can imagine. Um, and SOCs are a big thing in our business now, right? They're kind of a cornerstone of a lot of people's um, blue team defense and monitoring kind of piece. Um, and we're seeing more and more SOCs. You only kind of have to look at the MSSP market, look at uh, LinkedIn recruiters kind of trawling for people with SOC skills to know that this is a big and growing area, right? But we're still seeing massive security breaches all the time. Um, they're in the news pretty much on a weekly basis now. And again, latest stats are still selling us it's 100 days from an attacker getting into the network to detecting. Now, on one side, you might say, okay, that's good. A few years ago, that was up at 350, 400, right? But you're telling me we've got organizations paying people as a full-time job to detect threats, and it's still taking them 100 days. That's insane in my book. And the attacks we're talking about, they're not crazy sophisticated. If you think about stuff that's been in the news lately, um, one login, um, DNC, talk talk, none of those use kind of incredibly advanced unknown techniques or abilities to get in. It was the stuff that's documented and reported and people should be detecting. You've got the capability to do it, you know about it, kind of it should be in there, right? So why do they keep failing? Well, that's kind of a diverse question. Um, I see a lot of different types of socks. Some of them fail um, fairly quickly, some of them don't fail at all and succeed a lot, but come some, some of the common problems I see are socks that get flooded. So it's that typical story of alert fatigue. You're wanting to monitor everything, everywhere, all the time. And effectively, you can't do that. You have to prioritize, you have to be focused on something. Otherwise, you're gonna need a thousand analysts 24 seven churning through alerts. And even if you're doing that, you're not gonna have that focus to be able to find actually the bits that are important, tie them together to create the story, identify the intrusion, right? On the other side of that, you've got the socks that don't have enough data. So you've got, typically you see this with some kind of low level MSSPs where people just take, say, perimeter firewalls and say, we'll monitor this. Or you've got internal teams where they haven't got the buy-in, they haven't got the connections with the engineering teams to get the log sources they want pushed in to whatever system they're using. Um, you also have the Rockstar, Rockstar SOC. Um, this is one that I see far too often. Um, and normally these ones, great people working in them, um, great tool sets, great data sets, know what they're doing, but they've got the InfoSec Rockstar mentality, that ego. They're constantly looking for what is the latest, greatest, zero day, advanced nation state attacker. And they're completely missing actually the everyday threats that are facing them. They're the people that kind of, I don't know, have memory analysis of all their endpoints, but forget about the SMB share that's exposed to the internet. Um, you also get the secret SOC. So this is pretty relevant given the title of B-Sides this year, Sharing is Caring. How many people know of a SOC that is tucked away in a little room, that no one else can go in, that they do their business, they don't really talk to anyone else? This happens all the time. And these fail big time, and they fail quickly, because no one talks to them. And when they need to talk out to the business, they don't know who to talk to. So again, humans are a really good sensor. The rest of your business is a really good sensor. If you cut yourself off from that, you're losing a really key detection piece. And finally, you get those socks that have a big budget. They spent all their capex, they've got every tool under the sun, but actually, none of it's tied together. It's not really doing what they want because they haven't thought about it. They've just gone to InfoSec and bought all the shiniest things, right? And all of these kind of tie back into a lack of direction, a lack of focus on what is important to the SOC. What are they trying to detect? Where are they trying to detect it? What are they trying to do for the business? How is the business working? How are they adding value? So, okay, that's, that's why SOCs fail sometimes. So how can threat modeling help? So threat modeling gives you loads of different things. So first off, it helps you identify threats that you're facing, real life threats, how they're gonna appear, also gives you bis business context. Through threat modeling, you do modeling of your systems and how people use it. So you understand how the business is using the infrastructure you're defending. Again, having a network diagram of how your network looks is great, but if you don't understand how data flows around, how users interact with it, you're not really gonna understand it that well. So you've got these threats, so you've got the business context. You take those threats, 
push that out into use cases, things to look for, signatures to deploy to your systems, things to add to your threat modeling playbook. You also identify the data sources you need to be collecting. Well, they're collecting everything. You can say, okay, I want to detect this. To do that, I need X data source or Y data source. And you can limit it and kind of focus it a lot more. From that, you can go away and say, okay, look, I want to detect these things using this data. What tool can do that for me? Again, most people come to this and say, I've bought this tool. What data can I give it? What can I detect using it? Taking it the other way around gives you a lot more informed decisions about kind of what you're buying, why you're buying it. And again, it helps focus your priorities. Once you know what you're trying to detect, what your high priority is, you can focus more time on that, give a bit less time to kind of those alerts, those uh, threat hunting playbooks that are a little bit lower down your priority. And finally, by doing this, by digging into those data sources as well, you get more technical detail about your environment. You're not relying on network diagrams that were drawn 10 years ago and have never been updated. You've got kind of accurate, real-time data about kind of what the environment looks like. And again, sharing is caring, right? You can engage your business in the whole process of this. So you can say, actually, I'm not doing this as an infosec thing. It's driving, it's helping me. But actually, I want to go talk to the business. I want to go talk to the engineers, the architects, the legal team that use the systems and talk to them about all of this. Help them get involved in this process. Help them understand why you're doing it. Get that visibility, get that engagement. And again, you feed all of that back into your SOC. to add a lot of value. So no, threat modeling is great. It gives you all these things. How do you do it? So the threat modeling process is something some of you might be familiar with. So it's, well, the initial kind of threat modeling this is based off was developed back in the late 90s by Microsoft for their software development lifecycle uh, by a guy called Adam Chostak. And again, I've kind of used that process uh, and tweaked it for, for SOC. So effectively, what you're doing, you're modeling a system. You're kind of looking at how it looks like, how the data flows, what security controls you've got, where the data is. You're looking at the threats that face that system, where they face it, how they might get into that environment, how they might move around, where the lateral movement's gonna be, what their objectives are gonna be. You're gonna prioritize those. Again, typically when I do this, you get a couple of hundred threats. That's a hell of a lot. You can't just go away and do that. You need to prioritize it. You need to say, okay, what are my top 10 this week? Then you go away and develop those use cases. You develop mitigation. So again, I'm doing this from a SOC perspective. So you're going to want to detect the threats in there. You're going to work out how you're going to detect them. But actually, you're part of a blue team for your organization. You want to kind of help them develop as well by saying, look, we've developed, identified these threats. We're going to detect it in this way. But how about you do X or Y to help mitigate that rather than just relying on our detection? Um, then you want to go away and identify the data sources you need, as we talked about, kind of what do we need to identify those threats? Where are we going to put it? And finally, you can, you can go back and validate and say, OK, we want to detect these threats. We're putting in these use cases. We're taking this data. Is that going to be enough? Um, so I'm going to dive into a few of these elements in the model now. If, fortunately, in 15 minutes, I can't go through the whole life cycle in detail. Um, but modeling is one of the key elements. So what you're trying to do is model the key processes, data source, and data flows in your environment. So think about where data flows through. How does it come in? How does it come out? How do users access it? Not just your external users, but your internal users, your admin users. How do the DBAs get the database? How do your customers access your front end? And think about all the security controls they have to go through. So again, talking about those data sources, your security controls are great data sources. Unless you know kind of how they fit into that model, unless you can identify them all, you're gonna to struggle to get them in. And you're gonna to struggle to kind of process them and use them once you've got them in. Um, Kind of key bit with modeling is getting the level right. You don't want to be drawing a physical network diagram in every single kind of cable and every single port. At the same time, you don't want to be too generic. And it's a little bit of kind of give and take. Something like this sort of level, kind of logical, you haven't got every single bit of infrastructure, but you've got the main bits, uh, tends to work quite nicely. Threat enumeration. This is obviously the next big bit in the process. So there's loads of ways of doing this. Um, again, one way that is quite good, particularly when you're starting out, is the stride methodology. So again, this is developed by Microsoft for their software threat modeling. Um, and it's basically you're thinking about uh, threats that might occur under each of the categories in the middle. Um, and again, if you're doing this for the first time or you've got non-infosec teams involved, this is really cool to kind of help give them a framework to think about. Um, one of the other ways I really like doing it now, um, and it's quite good if you've kind of got maybe more experienced infosec guys doing it, is using the kill chain to 
map across the environment. So, okay, someone wants to conduct reconnaissance on the network. Where are they going to be doing it? How? Um, someone wants to deliver an exploit. How's that going to get in? Um, also, another good way of doing it is really scenario specific. So, let's say WannaCry happened um, the other week. You want to think, how could that happen to me? How could a ransomware get in? Okay, let's take that, let's model that on the system, see how they could get in, see how we could we stop it, how we could detect it. Um, and again, if you've got some data, if you're running a SOC at the moment, you've got data about what attacks you're seeing, take that, apply it to the whole environment. Really good. Um, there's also this great card game um, that follows the stride methodology, which is really good. Again, non-infosec people, you want to get them engaged, it's fun, it's kind of a little bit different. Um, it's a bit less um, kind of formalized, a um, little bit easier to think about. So, okay, you've got all of this great stuff out of threat modeling. How do you use it? Well, you've got something at pretty much every level. It's really good to take a threat modeling report and say, look, we need to invest in this tool, this technology. We need to put some time on this. Here's my proof. Look, we've done threat model report. This is the number one priority. And again, driving traction at a senior level to get engagement in security, this is a really useful tool putting that report down, having some data behind it, fantastic. Um, at tactical level, kind of maybe SOC leadership level, using it to kind of define what you're monitoring, making sure that you've got all the areas that you need to be included in your, your kind of remit uh, is really useful, and informing the tool selection, as I mentioned before. And then finally, at day-to-day -day level, you're identifying use cases out of it. Stick them in your tool set. Go put in the, uh, the kind of stuff into your threat modeling uh, threat hunting playlist, playbook, sorry. Um, think about kind of how you're gonna do this on a day-to-day -day basis. So, okay, told you about threat modeling. It's fantastic, right? Where do you go next? So, there's a bunch of resources online around threat modeling. As I said, most people do threat modeling in a software kind of environment. Um, not many people do it in infrastructure, and I haven't really met anyone else who does it in stocks. But there's a great resources out there, and they're really applicable. So, this book, written by Adam Shostak, fantastic, again. Not 100% applicable to, to what I'm talking about, but really good background. Um, but actually, what I'd say is just go do it. It's one of the great things of InfoSec of you don't need any money, you don't need any kit, you don't need any specialist skill to go do this. Just go, go run it. All you need is a room, some whiteboard, and a bunch of people. Go model the system, just ask some questions and draw it up on the whiteboard. Go through the threat enumeration piece using Stride or whatever kind of methodology you want to do. Um, and just make sure you're doing it with the whole business. So again, typically when I do this, I'm working with a security team. But I'm saying, look, let's get an architect in, let's get an engineer in. Um, and actually, when you're modeling the system, that can be some of the best interactions you get out of the whole system. Because you'll have the architect there saying, oh, it's designed like this, here's the network diagram. And the engineer suddenly pipes up and goes, well, actually, not really. We changed that a couple of months ago because it didn't work. Here's how it actually works. And from a SOC perspective, that's fascinating, if nothing else. Um, and finally, kind of sharing is caring, right? So if you're doing this, if you think about doing this, let me know. I'd love to have a conversation about it. I'll stick the slides up on peer list, obviously, after this. Have a conversation on there. Or just talk to me on Twitter. Again, I don't know too many other people doing threat modeling for SOCs. So if people start doing it, I'd love to hear kind of how it works for them. Have they come up with better ways of modeling, better ways of enumerating threats? Um, and again, yeah, share as much as you can. Great. Thank you very much. Um, if anyone's got any questions, obviously.